Welcome back to Men in Balance. And once again, we have the pleasure of talking to head coach of basketball at Davidson College, Bob McKellar. Hey, Bob, how are you? Good morning, Jerry. Wonderful to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much for making the time again. Um, well, before we get started on the stuff I want to talk about, let's talk about uh, basketball and wh where you are and what the season is going to be and what, what do you know that's new? Uh, we're, we're progressing. We're taking steps forward. And um, they're little steps, clearly restricted by the protocols. Uh, our guys are doing a sensational job of adhering to the protocols. Our assistant coaches have been extraordinary in the way they've uh, uh, taken this opportunity to emphasize details, to hold players accountable for details, to teach details. And I think as a result, we're in a very good place right now as we begin uh, final preparations for practice uh, next Thursday. So it'll be our first official practice. Up to this point, we've been able to have workouts restricted by the amount of time and obviously the COVID uh, protocols, uh, but they've gone very, very well. So what do you know yet about schedule or um, as far as for access to the arena? Well, it's a, a consistently uh, moving target. Uh, our plan right now, based upon uh, today, is that uh, we will play the night before Thanksgiving, a home game, uh, an opponent to be still determined. And then we'll travel on Saturday after Thanksgiving to Asheville, North Carolina, where the Maui Invitational Tournament has been uh, relocated. And we found out yesterday that our opening round opponent will be at noon on Monday, November 30th, against uh, the University of Texas. So what's going on in terms of uh, working with the players and the coaching and all of that? Uh, I'm seeing progress, tremendous progress. Uh, and uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased with their emotional uh, attachment to the challenges. Uh, or the evolving chemistry, uh, our senior leadership of Kellen Grady, Carter Collins, and Bates Jones have been sensational in uh, galvanizing the roster into a, a team at this point that really respects, communicates, works, challenges each other uh, to be the best we can become. And we're moving in that direction as we get ready for opening practice on uh, next Thursday. Um, so are you still in the, doing any recruiting or is that all taken care of? Where are you on that? <laughs> uh, it's nothing that we could just snap our finger and have somebody commit to us. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, logistically involved process because all of your recruiting is done from on campus or from your home. We're not allowed to travel. We're not allowed to go and watch games. So we're expected to and mandated to watch significant video, hold Zoom calls, conversations on phones, text messages, emails, uh, exploring every connection with the recruit so that as a result, we become as well versed about them as we possibly could, uh, handicapped and hamstrung because we can't go and see them personally, whether it be in their house, their school, or uh, watching them do a workout or play a game. And, and for us at Davidson, that's been a critical part of our recruiting process uh, to check the box of character, work ethic, uh, which um, pretty difficult to see that on a video, uh, pretty difficult to judge that uh, based solely upon a Zoom call or based upon a text or an email or a phone call. And uh, the eye to eye contact, the hand-in-hand uh, -hand shake, the uh, sitting down and exploring and seeing and watching uh, live action as well as live conversation uh, are pretty vital parts of our, us in our recruiting process. And uh, that's been taken out of the equation at this point. So it's mandated that we uh, do significantly more video work than we've ever done before. More phone calls, Zoom calls, emails, texts, uh, periphery people involved with the prospect. Uh, that has reached uh, levels we've never uh, explored before. And I assume your um, assistant coaches are helping out with all that? They're doing all of it. 
Yeah, no, that. <laughs> uh, they're, uh, they're, they're just been outstanding. I, I, I cannot be more pleased with a group of, of men that have worked as our assistant coaches uh, in the way they've handled the challenges that are presented by uh, the restrictions that we now face. That's great. Well, um, to move over to some of the uh, spiritual topics that we've uh, talked about before, in our last interview, we round, we ended that with your talking about um, the two things that we all have to give each other, um, love and time, and that you had um, worked on that over the course of your life. And I thought we might um, go a little deeper on that and just talk about what is it that you specifically mean when you say we need to give each other love and time? Um, it, the question was once posed to a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, if you had to live your life all over again, what would you do differently? And he made a simple statement. He said, I would love more. And I, I think about that statement often and uh, try to utilize that response in my own life. Um, time, uh, it, it's a gift that God gives to us. It's a gift that uh, uh, is so precious. It's a gift that at these times of uncertainty uh, becomes even more apparent to us. It's as though time has slowed down. There's a repetitive cycle of what happens each day because of us being uh, handicapped by the virus. So it gives us quite a bit of reflective time. Uh, it gives us quite a bit of analytical time. And uh, in that process, I think you understand how valuable and vital time is. Mm -hmm. And when you utilize it for the purpose of uh, advancing your walk with God, uh, I believe that that's what God has destined us to do. Um, he, he's not destined us to become uh, Hall of Fame coaches or uh, world famous CEOs or uh, presidents or famous people, but how can you use his gift of time to make this world a better place? And you make it a better place by number one, using the time, and number two, using that time to give love. And um, that, that's an ever present challenge in everyone's life, but one that we're greeted with each morning. And, and we have 24 hours uh, to do the best we can to fulfill that destiny that is ours as we choose our lives to be Christians. And uh, we, we need to take a recollection each night How'd I do today? You know, we lay in bed at night or we sit on our back porch and offer our evening prayers, whatever it might be. And we say, you know, what happened today that allowed me to use time that God gave me uh, to give love that he wants me to give? And of course, as I've said before, those are the two greatest gifts that he's given to us. Uh, but those are the two great gifts that he wants from us in return. Yeah, in the last interview, you, you talked about um, the fact that you wish you had been able to do more of that. Um, what, what would that look like for you? What, what do you think that means? You know, I wonder if, if this is not a, 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 a challenge that this time is presenting to us, giving us more of this opportunity. Um, I find myself more focused on those two objectives than... Um, watching a TV show, uh, following sports. Uh, and I, I find it fascinating how that time has been such a, uh, a, a vital part of my 24 hour day. Uh, you, know, you just think about this, uh, I'm a very, very uh, crazy college football fan. Uh, but for whatever reasons, I'm not watching college football now. I'm not watching the NBA playoffs. I'm not watching NFL football. And it's extraordinary how much more time I have. Time to use that gift of time and perhaps uh, give that love that is uh, such a necessary part of who we are as Christians. Um, 
sacrifice. Uh, that, that's a sacrifice to the life I've lived for so many years. It, it's been a, a typical routine for me to Sunday to sit in front of the TV for a couple of hours and watch NFL or Saturday to watch a couple of hours of NCAA football. Uh, that time is now not used for that purpose. And, and maybe I, I got hit over the head during this last couple of months to understand that. Mm. That's, that's great. Good to hear. Um, one time we've talked, you talked about the fact that when you first came to Davidson in what, May of 89, is that right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, that you really were pretty focused on becoming a world name or becoming certainly a well-known coach and building the program and so forth. And that uh, over time, I think you said you learned to sort of pace yourself a little more and not focus so much on career and that sort of thing. You want to talk about how that came about? I, I thought I could wave a magic wand and uh, ride off into the sunset and become an ACC coach or the coach of the New York Knicks. And um, it, it was a... Uh, a foolhardy, egotistical, arrogant, deep-rooted sense of pride that occupied my thoughts. And in, in that process, uh, you're climbing that ladder and you're stepping on so many rungs to get to that top of the ladder. But on those rungs, you never stood there for a second and, and looked around what is there. You just constantly had the focus of being consumed to get to the top. And um, I, I believe uh, our world has suckered us into that process. And, um, you know, I read something the other day. Um, it was, it was uh, Jesus spoke of what might be called a game plan in reverse. If you want to receive, you give. If you want to lead, you follow. We must become like children. The rich will become the poor. And, um, you know, maybe that's what we need to go back to because I did not have that same game plan. I had the game plan that the secular world wants us to have. Get to the top as fast as you can. So how do you balance that out? I mean, that, that's what men and balance is supposedly all about. But uh, you do have to do a fair amount of focus on career, but uh, how do you, how do you balance that out in your mind? I think it's got to be purpose driven. Uh, it, there's got to be emotional intentionality. You, you have to do things for a reason. And, and I find myself now doing things in pursuit of excellence for a reason that's far different and vastly different than what it had been in the past. Uh, the disease of me was something that uh, um, infiltrated my body. And that was the purpose. And I, I can still have a quest for excellence and have a quest for us to have a great team. But the purpose behind it, the intentionality behind it is to elevate those with me in the process to advance them. And in the process, hopefully they see that that has been what has driven me and that then might become what drives them as well. Hmm. Yeah, so, so it sounds like uh, there's a fair amount of effort in trying to get the ego out of the way so you can balance it all out. Did, did that sound right? Isn't that the, the, the greatest uh, source of sin in our life, pride, ego? Yeah. Um, I mean, we can go back to the opening of the Bible, uh, you know, Adam, <laughs> a little bit of ego there. Yeah. He wanted to be <laughs> like God. And um, I mean, maybe that's why the Bible began with that lesson uh, to let us understand that that's what's staring us dead in the eye every day. And probably the first and foremost of distractions, sins, demons that we're going to face. Um, you've talked in the past pretty openly about your prayer life. I um, wonder if you would talk some more about that and, and how that works into your daily routine and, and exactly what that means to you. Um, at growing up as a Catholic and 
being a devout practicing Catholic as I still am, uh, I was taught a lot of prayers, the recitation of words. And um, I, I find myself reciting less in terms of prayers as much as uh, having a conversation, um, a, a very intentional conversation, one in which uh, I, I really believe I'm, I'm speaking with God. And, and then I, I also have come to the understanding of uh, much like contemplative prayer in which I listen, I quiet down, uh, I, I become still and uh, I listen for God's voice. And, you know, just take, for instance, sitting in this, the beautiful weather we've had some evening and looking at the trees and hear the wind rustle through those leaves of the trees. And um, the beauty of that experience is, is God speaking to us and getting us to be attentive to him and it's contemplative for me to to be in that environment and and hear that but it's equally powerful for me to have a conversation with him so uh i i do that frequently and and i think we're creatures of ha i know we're creatures of habit and and I, i'm convinced that there are demons there are uh, distractions every turn that we take in our life every step we take there is something that's going to distract us and uh, I, I have a sense that uh, as I've prayed I've also asked for the grace to understand that in those moments of prayer that uh, those demonic distractions don't enter into it because they can very easily do that now let's let's just take for a second you're sitting there in church Jerry and you're, you're very, very deep in prayer and yet you're having this wonderful conversation with God. And all of a sudden somebody walks by you that maybe uh, triggers a memory of what happened in the basketball game last night or what happened in the parking lot when they took your parking spot or whatever it might be. Those kind of distractions can really disrupt what connection you have with God at that point in your prayer life. And uh, I, I feel that I've been praying more for the grace to understand that, boy, I need you as an armor in those times, because those times come every second, no matter where I am and no matter what I'm doing. Wow, that's powerful. Um, in the past, I know we've talked about the fact that you're pretty open about sharing your faith and your um, and, and your image uh, of life with players as you're coaching them off the court. So can you talk a little bit about how that goes and, and maybe some examples of where you're pretty pleased with how that went? Um, well, uh, God has blessed me as he's blessed very few. Um, he's put into my sight tremendous people from all over the world and given me the opportunity to touch them. Um, it's not anything that I'm doing that I'm touching them with. Um, what I have been given has been given to me as a gift. I, I think the secret of what I have become as a coach has been prayer. That's where I've been given the light. That's where I've discovered the joys and the beauties of coaching. So, for example, and I'll share a very intimate experience from yesterday's workout. I noticed that two of our players, older seniors, leaders, showed tremendous kindness in the workout to the two freshmen, uh, encouraged them, inspired them, patted them on the back, talked to them, did not treat them as they were freshmen nor did those two seniors act like they were seniors. They acted like they were human beings with kindness towards another human being. Now we're talking about a basketball practice. We're not talking about someone lying in the street, uh, hopeless and helpless. So, but we're talking about practice. And I, and I 
reached out to both of those seniors last night and thanked them for that. And by acknowledging that, now maybe that will trigger in their mind, hey, that's a good thing. And maybe I should do more of that. And that's what I encouraged them in my connection with them last night was that don't let this just be a practice thing. Let this be part of your life. That's where you get this marvelous opportunity as a coach. But, but I'm convinced that we are all coaches, uh, coach father, coach spouse, uh, coach in the community, coach of our basketball team. Wherever we are, we're a coach. And um, uh, I'm very fortunate to find myself aware of having those opportunities and being in that position. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that. And um, one of the questions that comes up a lot in talking to men is uh, the difficulty of expressing your faith, like in the workplace or when you're with other guys or whatever. Um, and, and it sounds like that's something you've overcome. I'd just like to hear you talk about how, how important that is to make that part of your natural human nature. Well, that's, again, something that uh, I've been blessed with. It's, it's a grace from God that uh, uh, I don't have any vulnerability when that comes as an opportunity. I, I have no fear. I, uh, I, I trust. I trust that this is what God has asked me to do. And um, my misfortune is that Sometimes my words don't always get backed up by my actions. And uh, that's the nature of man and the nature of sin. Uh, but believe me, I try diligently and, and passionately uh, with the help of God's grace to make sure that my words are backed up by actions. Uh, but I have no fear of that vulnerability. And um, I... I even have been in situations where there's been resistance. Uh, people don't want to hear that. They, they change the subject. They don't want to listen. They walk away. Um, I, I really believe that that's, again, a distraction and a, and a demonic attempt to prevent us from becoming who God wants us to be. Mm. That's excellent. Um, I think I asked you one bit once before about um, if you had the chance to be in front of, front of some of these young kids, I mean, really young kids who are thinking about basketball as a, a career or certainly playing basketball in school or whatever. What advice would you give these kids to make all of their life, uh, make it all come true? Well, uh, giving advice and, and showing advice are two different things. And um, I, I think the best way to do it is to show it by the way you live your life. So for example, what I did yesterday with the seniors, uh, uh, saying it is one thing, but acknowledging it when they do it is another thing. And it reaffirms to them and validates for them that, uh, that that's a good thing. And, and I, I believe that that's what we have to constantly do. And that would be my advice to kids. Uh, you know, treasure the gift you have right now. You, you have a gift of time, you have a gift of love. And, and I don't know that our kids today, I don't know that our adults today can understand that as well as I've come to understand that. It's only through, I, I guess, as you've uh, uh, gotten older and experienced, but also as you've been given more grace. And I really believe it all comes back to prayer. I, 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 I can't say enough how important a prayer life is in terms of uh, living your life the right way. Any closing comments you'd have for the average guy out there who's following David's basketball and sports in general and, and doesn't have a lot of spiritual life to speak of? What would you, what would you say to him? You know, you have that great uh, commercial on TV. It's not what's in your wallet. The Capital One commercial. I'd rather say it's not what's in your wallet, it's what's in your heart. And um, as I said earlier to begin this conversation, if, if I had to start my life all over again, I would love more. 
And that would be my advice. Uh, use your gift of time, use your gift of love as consistently and as kindly as you possibly can. Um, it's very difficult to live in our world today, but you, you know what, Jerry, I, I've been a history student all my life. I was a history teacher and a history major. And um, you know what we're experiencing in today's world is no different than what the 1940s were like, or the 1920s were like, or the 1860s were like, or the 1700s, or 2,000 years ago when Jesus came. Why did he come? There are Sanhedrins, there are Pharisees. They're just dressed in different clothes today. Mm. But they're everywhere. Yeah. That's a great note to end on. Bob, I want to thank you so much for your willingness to be so um, vulnerable and open and talking about your uh, spiritual life and sharing that with us. Uh, the last time you and I had an interview, it um, got more hits, as they say, on, uh, on the web than anything we've done. <laughs> so I'm pleased with that, and I appreciate your being willing to do that. Well, thank you for this forum that uh, you provide for all people, men, women, and children. I, I think it's a vital ministry, and it's it's great coaching. Well, so thank, thank you, you Coach Jerry. <laughs> well, uh, not not in the sense that you're a coach, but I certainly appreciate the compliment. And thanks for your time again. Okay, Jerry. I'm in, I'm Jerry Hancock from Men in Balance. Thanks for joining us.